press the formal record. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the roundtable today about artificial intelligence and fire service culture. Um, today, I'm really excited to have both Dr. Bert Clark and, and Bart, I'm going to book your last name again, because I always do it, Bart Van Leeuwen. Lofen, Lofen, fun, fun Leven, but uh, I forget. You, you know that. <laughs> I, I, one of these days, I am going to get it right, and I apologize because uh, I, I need to nail that down. Um, but these are two people that I can point to that have taught me a significant amount over the past ten years in the fire service. And you may be wondering, AI in the fire service, AI and fire service culture, what does this all mean? And within the fire service context. Um, we talk a lot about new technology, but at the deeper root, it doesn't necessarily really have anything to do with technology. It actually is a lot more about change management and adoption within the fire service. And one thing that I'm, I'm sure Bert will talk about is the technology of a seatbelt. It's great technology because it works, but it only works when you actually use it. And with anything in life, I think it's really important that we take a step back and ask ourselves why. Why are we doing it this way? Um, there is a combination of nature and nurture. And in the fire service, we can accredit a lot of the actions of our DNA woven into from the father of the fire service, Benjamin Franklin. The need to get to fires fast, the need to get close to fires, the need to put the wet stuff on the red stuff. Some of this still holds very true, but a lot of this has changed around the built environment, the funding avenues, and some new technologies, such as the rise of artificial intelligence. Um, AI is something today that fascinates me, but frankly, also terrifies me. And this is something where today we want to this to be something where we can have a holistic view on this idea of fire and artificial intelligence and how we're feeling change in the fire service. So we have Bart and Bert, and without me rambling on too much more, I want to kind of lay a little bit of ground rules with the idea is that both Bart and Bert are going to give some remarks and comments. And then this is a chance for all of you to be selfish all of you to ask questions to make this about you but at the same time if you once you get the conch i don't want you to talk for more than let's say two minutes you know kind of if you got a question ask it if you got two cents drop it and we're documenting this whole thing and we'll be sending out a report afterwards so i want everyone to be very mindful and respectful of everyone else and to know this is a place of respect and dignity and honor um, so please just be mindful of that um, but so without further ado, um, I'm going to have uh, Dr. Bert Clark give an intro, then Bert, then Bart give an intro, and then Bart will give his remarks, followed by Bert, and then we're going to leave it open to the audience. So if you got um, questions now, feel free to just kind of fire up the chat. Um, but Bert, please, for a minute or two, for those of us that don't have the fortune of knowing you, and frankly, I can happily say, you know, my, my copy of my books at my over there, but um, Bart or Bert, uh, lead us off with giving us a little uh, combo conversation of who is Dr. Bert Clark? Well, I'm the old guy on the show today. That's that. Let's start there. So I'm the old guy. <clears throat> so there's some advantage and disadvantage in that. I've been around a long time. I started in the fire service in 1970 as a volunteer. I retired in 2014 as the department chair for the management science program at the National Fire Academy. In between that period, I earned a doctorate in adult uh, learning. And even though I'm dyslexic, I've published and written a lot in the fire service. And most of it is non-technical in nature. And for some reason, I got very interested in culture as the foundation for almost everything we do personally, in our families, in our communities, in our discipline, in our cultures. So that's the lens that I look at all this stuff through. And it just blows me away to think that uh, the kid in elementary school who failed every spelling test and every writing test is now on a worldwide communications process roundtable talking about artificial intelligence. None of my elementary school teachers would have ever believed that I could possibly be here. Uh, but at the same time, since I've started doing some looking at the whole nature of dyslexia, uh, various organizations are predicting that dyslexics are some of the people that will do the best using AI. Because we ask the kinds of questions that really will bring the best out of AI. So that gives me hope for myself and uh, all my other brother and sister 
firefighters out there that are dyslexic. So uh, don't be afraid of it. Uh, it's here. And uh, we're going to get on and talk about it and have some fun. I'm done. Thanks, Bert. And now over to his uh, new partner in crime, Bart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love the, the 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 complexity of the double combination of bird and bard. But um, yeah, so um, consider at my station, I'm still I'm considered one of the older guys. But if I hear the history of birds, it's like oh, I I have to show some some respect for that. How long he's been working in the fire service? Um, I always introduce myself as wearing multiple hats and helmets. Um, I think the, the, the thing that I start with where the AI part comes in, I run a company, NetEdge. We do smart data for smarter firefighters. I've been around for probably 15 years in this space, uh, looking at how to capture knowledge and to how to process information, operational information. In that light, I also work at the uh, Free University in Amsterdam on the human-centric uh, data science uh, group, where we look at how humans interact with, with the information. And I'm sort of doing a sidestep there where I'm part of the hybrid artificial intelligence group as well, where we look at how people uh, can interact with uh, artificial intelligence. How can we make uh, the, the synergy between humans and artificial intelligence work better? I am also a uh, master instructor for Situational Awareness Matters, uh, the company by uh, Dr. Richard Gassaway. So I can officially call myself an expert on situational awareness and, and how the the decision making under stress works. Um, and that brings me to my uh, sort of job that I work at the Amsterdam Fire Department where I'm a captain. Been there for almost 23 years now, um, no 22, but in total, I have 27 years of experience in the fire service. And that is what I bring uh, to the table. And where I'm really interested is uh, uh, two things which I would love to discuss with everybody is. Um, we hear a lot that artificial intelligence is going to improve the decision making on the fire ground, and that sparks my interest because, from my work for SA Matters, I'm I'm convinced that we actually do not really know how we, as as fire service people, make decisions at the fire ground, let alone that we can be supported by artificial intelligence. There's been plenty of research where they asked fire commanders afterwards, like, what was the the rationale to get to the decision you made, and they simply cannot articulate on what they actually decided, what that process was. How on earth can we then say that AI is going to improve the process, which we do not understand yet? So that is, that's one part. Uh, the other part, and I've, I've been working on some papers for that, is the challenges when adopting AI is that we are, as a fire service, a knowledge-driven organization, but the knowledge that we have is mostly transferred verbally and through experience. If we want AI to improve our decision-making and help us, then we need to go to the point that we actually write down our knowledge and put that in systems and, and, and store and capture data that this AI system can be trained upon. Um, I actually saw uh, Matt Heinz uh, join, um, uh, join the call as well. And, and we have been having some great fun and looking at Enverse data, how really, really bad that is, for example. And if they, these are, data sets that we want to train our AI on, we're in big trouble. So that's sort of the technical part. And I think, and, and that's where probably I can give it back to Bert, that he can make a statement, is that if we want AI to succeed within the fire service, we need to start hiring and training our people uh, right now and um, people who are willing and able to work together with this technology and train these people because if we're not doing that now, we're going to lag behind. And like with so many other new technologies in the fire service, we're lagging behind. So we need to step up our game and really start to embrace this technology. And frankly, we, we should aim for critical thinkers and people who ask questions. And maybe that is what Bird was actually referring to. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Bart. And just another reminder to everyone, continue to think about some, uh, have some emotional responses to what you're hearing and write down some ideas and questions that you can fire back after after Bert's done talking here in a bit. And this is meant to be a two-way dialogue. Um, so be prepared to, again, ask questions, drop comments after Bert's done, and, and we'll get it going. So um, so yeah, Bert, how would you want to kind of add on to that and, and kind of give your your thoughts based on what, what Bart just said there? Well, again, thank you. I'm, I'm looking forward to this and uh, even preparing for this has been an eye-opening experience for me at so many different levels. Just to give you some background in terms of where I started with the whole concept of computers, 
when I was in high school in my junior and senior year, we actually had, I think it was a data processing thing. I don't think you would call it a computer. We were, my class were the first ones to put all of our attendance records and our grade levels on this database. So we would get a printout every day of who was in class, who wasn't in class. And then the teachers would turn in all the grades to us and we would print out for the first time the students' report cards in a printout as opposed to being handwritten by stuff. So that's how I was introduced to it. And surprisingly, I did well in those classes. I didn't do well in the English classes and the history classes, but for some reason in a computer class, along with my accounting classes, it made sense. And I went from you know uh, uh, a low grade student to a better student in high school because of those business classes and particularly the computer classes. So when I got out of school, I went to a business college to begin with, continuing that whole process with computers. And we actually, in my two years of college, we used an IBM 360, which is pretty high level for that time, at a, at a uh, hospital that we did all of our programming at at night. So, and I learned COBOL, so I could program in COBOL. That's how old I was. And... Um, but then that became very monotonous. And I, when I finished school, I started being a firefighter in 1972. So I didn't pursue that. The fire service answered those questions. But when I look back uh, as a DC firefighter uh, in, the, in the mid seventies, I was the first one to put fire loss data in the blue high school computer system. I got the students to enter the data. We printed it out. We calculated it, and we identified the census tracts in the city that had the most fire deaths, uh, injuries, dollar loss, and number of incidents, and we color-coded it. So it was the first time Washington, D.C. ever used a computer to identify where its fire problem was. Now, it never went anyplace because I was a lowly private, right? The upper-level people didn't value it, but for me, it was a great experience. So I've always been on a cutting edge of technology. When I ended up at the fire academy, the NFA uh, was one of the first schools to have laptop computers or uh, PCs. We actually used apples um, in a computer lab. And we would teach people how to do that. So I wasn't part of that curriculum, but I knew about it. I learned about it. And then it was my turn. I put laptop computers with computer-based instruction in my classrooms where students could use it. I was the first one to do that. So the whole notion of being connected with uh, the very early parts of computer and where we are now. So now to bring it up to date. So I've known about AI. I've never used it. Uh, we, so to prepare for this, I've known about chat GPT for a while. So I actually went on to sign up for chat chat GPT and try it out. Well, when you do that, you put all your information in, but then the system wants to know if you're a robot or a human being. So it gives you cues or a test. And the first test was a visual test. There was a picture of something on the left. And then the thing that you had to move around with the arrows on the right-hand side, I could not do it. I failed the test. Every time I took it, I failed it. I dropped out, came back in, failed it again. So, so right off the bat, as a dyslexic, I could not navigate that original test to see if I was a computer. I failed. Luckily, on the screen, there was a picture of a headset. So just out of, out of frustration, I clicked on that, and now a different test showed up. Instead of being or visual, it was auditory. So I played a sound, it, it, it gave me a, a cue that said, uh, listen to these sounds and identify which one is a, our bumblebees. So the first one was the bumblebee sound. I failed that first one too. On the second time, it said, which one is running water? And I passed that one. So it took me several rounds to convince AI that I wasn't a computer. 
So that was very humbling on my part. And I don't know how many other, either I'm really stupid or that could be a problem for many people to get through that process. That would be an interesting discussion for later on. So when I got into AI, I went and I asked it a question. I said, how can AI help the fire service? This is the answer. And it's absolutely brilliant. I'll just synopsize if I may. It said it can help a lot. He, here how it can assist firefighters. Early fire detection, predictive analysis, decision support, robotics and drones, training and simulation. All of those are absolutely correct, and we've experienced that in some level. Here, here's, here's one of the most important parts of this. Over, I'm going to read what it said. Overall, IA technology has the potential to enhance situational awareness, optimize resource allocation, and improve response time in the fire service. By leveraging the power of AI, firefighters can better protect lives, property, and communities from the uh, from the de from devastating effects of fire. This human would like to edit it by saying, AI can also help reduce morbidity and mortality of firefighters. So sometimes we don't make that jump. We realize we can do our business better, but it can also help us have fewer injuries, fewer medical problems, and fewer deaths. So that alone should be a motivating factor for us to do this. Um, I'm delighted to be here. And one more plug, if I will. I don't know where Patrick Jackson is, but if Patrick Jackson is out there, Patrick was a firefighter that I met in 2014. And I think we either did an interview online or something because Patrick Jackson was an AI computer guru and he created Google Glass that would help in response, showing where fire hydrants are and the directions how to get there. He was so good, I believe Google hired him. And now, supposedly, Patrick Johnson, a former firefighter, is a software engineer at Google. So uh, for your next show, uh, Kevin, please have Patrick Johnson on the show, because I think he's... I'd like to hear more from Patrick in terms of where we need to go with AI. I'm done. Glad to be here. Thanks, Bert. And in a moment here, I want to open to the audience. But before we do that, Bart, I know you you have a similar but different perspective from, from what Bert was saying, but I, I was really intrigued, Bart, um, kind of your conversation about that. How can AI improve a process we don't actually understand? And we have a lot of this deeply embedded nuances within the fire service culture some for better some for for maybe kind of what is our some of our downfall um but i'd love to hear kind of bart your take in regards to some of our our predisposed dna in terms of how we operate and how that's creating a challenge to try and integrate ai and, and maybe any sort of hot takes or ideas you have in terms of the challenges or or kind of what we need to do to again you both evolve some of the culture to 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 leverage the best that could come from AI integration into aspects of the fire service. Yes. Yeah, so so um, to that point, I think that um, what we should not forget is that what AI is really good to add, and some of the uh, the, the replies that uh, Bert got from from ChatGPT is about predictive analytics, so taking large amounts of data and finding sort of common patterns, um, sort of the, the 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 default patterns in there. Um, I think uh, we should not forget that we as a fire service, we we are actually there for the outliers and, and detecting outliers is, is really complicated because if if the incident we would go to would be very common, we would come up with a policy to prevent these incidents from happening. So we are always there for the outliers in general. Um, AI is really bad at dealing with outliers. So we need to shift how we want to use that in, in our in our operations, the thought process, how we use that in our operations. Um, not only because the information is wrong, but also, uh, or the, the information is problematic at best uh, that we feed in the AI systems currently, but also because we, we are dealing uh, with outliers. So we maybe should rethink how we want to use AI to, to help us. So that's one point. Um, and, the, and the other point is that obviously, 
um, it's a it's a, it's a craft firefighting, so it's being transmitted and, and told through stories and and the, the training and the education that we get, um, and we're not really capturing that right now. Uh, a lot of a lot of the things that you you teach your new firefighters is almost anecdotal. Um, so we're not really good at capturing that what we know so that actually uh, artificial intelligence could help us sort of service that knowledge in, in the time that we need that. Um, and if you if you talk to a lot of firefighters currently is I don't want to work with computers. I hate working with computers. And obviously, and probably the exceptions are in the audience now, but uh, uh, working with computers is not something that's being eagerly done. This I see that the crews that I lead at my fire station. So that is where we need to change. Um, sort of the, the 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 people that we bring in as well, if we want to change that. Well said. And now I want to open up to the audience, and I'm going to volunteer certain people. And when you talk, give us a quick your name, the company, or organization you work with, and give us a question or a comment. And uh, I'm looking at uh, Alex Corsak uh, here, who who's uh, on the screen with his with his uh, little smile there. So Alex, I'm going to volunteer you to kind of lead us off from a community to you know maybe. Give us uh, your two cents, ask a question to, to Bert and Bart to get the community side going here. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so uh, first, you're both awesome. Um, Bert, I met you in DC like a month ago, so I can yeah. confirm that you're not a computer uh, <laughs> or you're an incredibly well-designed computer that mimics human form very well. I don't know. Um, and Bart, as I just posted in the chat, um, everybody should read Black Swan um, by Talib, um, which you recommended to me. Um, it is an incredible book and really dives into how people can manage Black Swan and disruptive events. Uh, you know, I would absolutely say that before we can really dive into AI, because like, you know, so I use ChatGPT heavily. I talk to ChatGPT more than anyone else in my life. It is my best friend. Um, journaling, cooking, writing, writing emails, writing proposals. I talk to ChatGPT at least three or four hours a day. And as much as I would love to say, um, oh, by the way, um, co-founder of Ascent Integrated Tech, um, put sensors on firefighters. We track where they are, how they're doing, map the battle space. As much as I would love to dive in and just be like, hey, tech and AI is going to solve all of our problems. I absolutely agree with Bert and Bart two rock stars, that we don't fundamentally understand the decision-making framework and how cognitive load theory can be applied to the fire service. Um, and I also touched on this a bit in, in one of my messages here in the chat, is that fundamentally, when we are looking at how fire scenes are run, this is something that Bart and I talked about, I don't know, two or three months ago, is that we're trying to understand things objectively. Right? The ICs on the ICs, they're trying to understand things objectively to make the best possible decision framework in the austere chaotic environment. But fundamentally, they see what they see. The information that's being read, relayed to them is crappy. It is subjective and it's verbal. And it's really just, it's an inefficient, bad communication medium to express something as complex as a fire ground. So, I totally agree. We need to really like deep dive into how does cognition on the fire scene work before we can even think about AI as being fundamentally an extension of our own cognition. Because at its core, the one of the best things about AI is that it can we can offload cognition onto it. We can do pattern recognition, we can do analysis, like Bart said. It's really crappy when it comes to outliers, but fundamentally we have to understand how cognition is being done now. The drawbacks and successes, what works, what ain't working so well before we can think about what aspects of cognition to offload. Okay, can I give a real quick example of that? Please. All right. Uh, I had the honor to be with these folks at a major metropolitan fire department recently where they were demonstrating their, their brand new uh, firefighter identifier. Uh, his company has been able to solve the Z. We got the, a, we got the X and Y, but they could tell what floor the firefighter was on. So that was amazing. And I was honored to go down there and watch them do this with, if I can get it right, off the shelf hardware, 
because it was basically an iPhone that the firefighter wore. Um, so that was great technology. The IC could watch it in real time on his laptop, on his uh, iPad. But at the same time, they had other firefighters there going through typical hose and ladder evolutions. And we were standing next to a group of people that were being trained by the trainer on how to do a four-person carry on a ladder. And they were, they were executing it, and they did it, and they were doing it a couple more times. But then the instructor said to them, we don't do it that way in the real world. We only do it that way in training. So we, we don't know our cognition, the difference between how we train people to do it and how they really do it. So if, if we don't know the answers to what we do and how we do it and why we do it, how could we possibly teach a computer to figure that out? So, you know, that's, that, that's a challenge. <laughs> you know, that, that, that was the biggest takeaway I had from that day, that we still have a problem of figuring out what's the best way to put a ladder up and then actually teaching people to do it that way and then executing it that way in the real world. So hopefully AI can help us solve that problem. I don't know, but that I just want to make that observation. Plus give a shout out uh, to your company for being able to, to have such a great piece of hardware and software it was excellent. I'll be quiet. Bart, did you want to add on to that? And then we'll throw it to Dave Robertson. No, no, no. I, I, like, like I said, Alex and I had a brilliant conversation. So he captured that. I agree with, uh, with Bert is that we, we, we think that we, we can bring in the technology and make everything better when some of the basics we haven't figured out. And, and this, this like, oh, well, you don't do that in the real world. That probably resonates globally. I mean, I'm from a European fire department, but I've heard these, the same types of stories. So um, yeah, the, the, if we if we do not change that culture, AI is not gonna gonna help us. It's actually potentially it's gonna make it worse. Good stuff, Dave. What do we got? Quite tell us who you are quickly and give us a question comment on the. Um, uh, absolutely, yeah, uh, Dave Robertson. I'm I'm uh, calling in from uh, Ontario, Canada. Hello, Kevin. Hello, Chief Bert. Haven't seen you since hey. the EFO symposium. There Good to go. see you again. Uh, my buddy Jerry Strike is on here too. So those are the hellos. Um, my question is is far more fundamental than a lot of this higher level uh, discussion. Um, you know, I'm I'm not going to lie. I'm struggling trying to keep up with this. Uh, so I'm somebody who is coming at this, having experienced AI on some incredibly fundamental levels, including an app that I'm a, a part of called Any Question. Um, and on any question, uh, p anybody can basically type in a question to a subject matter expert, and I'm one of them. And on the back end, the Any Question app developers are also utilizing AI uh, to generate additional questions. And, uh, and that's kind of, that is roughly my extent. But what I'm missing is, and, and I feel like actually, Dr. Clark, you have maybe touched on it in your last comment a little bit when you were talking about Alex and his company and your experience. Uh, in solving the Z-axis. Um, uh, but my question is, are we, is there a bit of a cart before the horse situation happening with AI here? Um, I, I'm, have we identified, have we identified the gap in, in from an operational standpoint uh, in the fire service that AI needs to step in and handle? Anything aside from just data management and, you know, data provision and, you know, uh, a collection and dissemination and that sort of thing. Aside from that, I'm talking about um, on the fire ground from, from grunt on up to command. Uh, I heard you, Bart, where you're talking about, uh, you're with uh, uh, SMA with Dr. Gassaway. Um, do we, have we even recognized the gap that it's going to fill yet? Can I, can I comment on that, Kevin? Oh, that's what it's about. Okay, perfect. Um, this, this reminds me uh, of a, a, a show I was at a couple of weeks ago in, in, in Helsinki, Finland, Critical Communication World, where they showed uh, communication uh, uh, technology uh, in, the, in the broadest sense. So from portable radios, tetra radios and, and everything. And I walked at the show floor and my remark from a sort of the nerdy type in me was like, oh, that's great. Bells and whistles, colors and, and displays and, and uh, 
police cars filled with 20 displays, et cetera, et cetera. And then I started wondering, like, where is the human in this? And then later on, I started realizing, is, isn't this, aren't these solutions looking for problems? And that is the comment I think you're trying to make as well. It's like, is AI a solution to a problem we not have yet identified? But since everybody talks about it, we should do AI as well. That is a gut feeling I get now and then. Um, that's especially, exactly the question I was asking. Yes, yeah. thank you for phrasing that. Yeah, that, that's um, and and it's an it's a, a very uh, very accurate one um, because with with all the the hypes and the technologies, people do not are in the fear of missing out. People do not want to leave behind. So, oh yes, we're going to do AI. Actually, at one fire department two years ago, it's like, could you? rephrase the offer you're doing with, with some of the data science work we're doing, uh, that it's AI. And I said, well, it's not AI. Yeah, but when it's AI, it sells better. It's, it's in that frame. Um, and we're, we're missing the human part out of this. And I think that's super important because it's, it's for humans by humans. So if we do not frame that we need to take along the people and be cognizant of the limitations of people working with AI, it's gonna go nowhere. It's gonna be a lot of money spent uh, on things we're not going to use in the end. That's my personal opinion, though. The the thing that I would add to the to the discussion too is that the fire service is really just a subset of the bigger culture. So we need to look at how change happens in the bigger culture, because it's going to happen someplace else before it happens to us. Now, once in a while, there's something that comes along. That is, that is so useful for us that we are the first ones to use it. And the, the example I use all the time is the telegraph. The first commercial and public use of the telegraph before it was even used to send messages across the country was the fire alarm box in the Boston area. So that's, so no, nobody in the fire service said we need to have fire alarm boxes on every street corner. That was where Somebody had a technology, and it was usually some outsider that said, maybe the fire service could use this. Another one is Nomex. I can remember buying my first Nomex hood in 1974. And Nomex hoods were designed for race car drivers. I was the first guy in the DC fire department to wear a Nomex hood. I'd carry it back and forth with me to Kentland and, and the DC. And nobody called me a brave firefighter because I wore a silly hood. It wasn't until the squad guys asked me where I got that from. We showed them the label on the inside. They rode away to the company and bought their own. Then they didn't pick on me anymore. And I, I think historically, that's happened throughout the history of the fire service. So in terms of Bart's point of view, we, we are going to have firefighters that are enthusiastic and interested in AI. They're going to be the rookies. And they, they are going to push us to start using that, whether we want to or not. It's do we create an environment that capitalizes on that the same way that this guy, Patrick Jackson, created Google Glass so he could find the hydrants when he was riding to the fire, driving to the fire, right? Uh, for us, to, for, for Patrick to do the best, he had to leave the fire service. Therein lies the challenge. How do we create incubators that do all this stuff to show success and then other people are going to want to do it? I'll be quiet now. Well said. And if you want to, if you have something you want to ask, it's because the, a lot of people continue to raise your hand. That's like uh, Chief Z, uh, Sam Matthews, you, you'll go next, but we'll go Kim, if you wanted to, the floor is yours. Question to two cents. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I, you know, we're starting off with some great conversations. So I'll share with you in 2013 on the Rim Fire uh, outside of Yosemite, we actually used the uh, military MQ-9 to send us live data. We intermixed it with uh, a program called Scout where we could use mapping and, and, and that. The uh, most interesting thing about it was is using the Air National Guard and, uh, and, and, and the Cal Pretty National Guard with our, our fire folks, uh, a lot of commonality actually going back to when we started mixing during late World War II and in Korea, when we started mixing air to ground uh, uh, and, and getting terminology uh, back together um, was one of the interesting things that happened. But a lot of what we're doing today, and I think uh, Bird and I already, you know, 
uh, hit part of it is, so we're, we're gonna have all this capability. <clears throat> now the real drill is, you know, do we have the people with the knowledge to process it? And, you know, I, I talk about dashboards pretty regularly. Um, you know, I, I see the future of our, of, our, of our chief officers today. They're gonna have to have, you know, uh, some technology person sitting next to them to help them process and understand some of what we need to do uh, for the day's personnel. And, you know, the, the, those people that will be standing next to them as technology experts will actually be the next chief officers that'll need to step in, will have a lot more capability. But that's, we are having a very hard time in today's day processing the technology and how we're gonna utilize it. And, and, and technology is good only to a certain point, but, you know, the, the conversation, how would you make that decision? Um, you know, and I, I, I always tell people, I always remember, I always remember getting promoted to battalion chief and the fire chief saying, got you two words of advice. He says, don't let anybody usurp your authority on the fire ground. And two is don't beat the apparatus to the call. But, you know, you come back to this. And again, I think that we're in the middle of a, of a great evolution. It's how we steer it and how we bring our people to uh, absorb the technology. And there's so much out there. Even our 911 centers are, are struggling. Uh, the folks that are, you know, doing the dispatching, uh, you know, look at, look at the days, you know, we used to have radios that, you know, were, 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 were you know, chips in them. But now, you know, 500 channels and can you actually know where to go and to figure those out? Um, let alone the people that are working in USAR and, and HAZMAT and absorbing that technology. So, Again, we're going to have to continue to, as we take on the technology, come up with ways of how we're going to use it and uh, and and learn it um, with you know the leadership we have today versus leadership that's coming up, uh, and never a more interesting time uh, than than what we I think have today. Bert and Bart want to give some thoughts on that, and then we'll we'll I'll go to Sam and then Matt after that. Go ahead, Bart. <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> um, yeah, there's some, there's some 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 good points in there. Um, um, when when you started, but the, the officers need somebody to process information. In 2012, in the AMSM Fire Department, we lost the seven men on the rig, um, and I was doing some union work back then. And I claimed that the mayor at that point in time was like, "We we probably need that seven man on the rig anytime soon as an information manager." We're not there yet, um, but one of the one of the interesting things that is barely ever coming up is uh, more the ethical part of using AI uh, when we're gonna when we're gonna do decision support with AI. Who's responsible for the for the for the for the um, for the misfortune? Um, and and the same goes for the amount of information that we make available to first responders. Currently, when they go on scene, the iPads are completely stacked with endless amounts of documents. Do we ever get to a point that somebody who's made a decision under stress at the fire ground, which turned out to be the wrong decision, is going to be held liable for the fact that he didn't go through the gigabytes of data on his iPad because there was the right answer? Um, and I like, I, I love this brilliant scene from Sully, although I, I know um, this is dramatized where he basically asked in the courtroom, can we make it human? Um, and that is really one of the largest problems we're currently having with the amount of information available and with the limited cognitive capabilities of our incident leaders, where we might indeed need an information manager on scene at every fire, but aren't we overloading that person as well? Because it's still a person. So I like some of these, uh, some of these comments. The, the, thing I, the thing I would add is just like the chief was talking about, they were actually able to use somebody else's AI at the fire. So I think if we just capitalize on what's out there now and just become aware of what's available, that will be a step in the right direction. Um, how many times is there a firefighter fatality because they didn't know there was a basement in the building because nobody did a 360? The fact that there's a basement in the building should already be available on some database almost in every community. Because you can't, you can't charge your property tax 
if you don't know how many floors a building is. So, so how could we capitalize just on that platform that's there that somehow that information is communicated to the responding units. This is a one story single family dwelling. It does have a basement. The basement is located, the basement entrance is located on side Charlie, right? That, that could have saved at least one firefighter because they never, they never went and looked for the basement door. So by us telling that person when they're responding, there is a basement, there's an outside basement door, we would be so far ahead of where we are now. So Bert, I'm gonna keep going rapid rapid fire on a couple of questions, but I wanna to get to as many people as possible. So we're gonna go I'll Sam, no, you you keeping loud, uh, but we're gonna go Sam Sam Matthews and then I got Matt and then Josh. So yeah, tell us again who you, who you are, what organization you're with, um, and then yeah, give us kind of your thoughts, a question or whatever you wanna to add to the conversation here. Hi, I dropped a, a slide deck in the chat. Sorry, I'm on two different devices right now. It's really confusing, but um, audio issues. So uh, I think it's really important. Something that we've had a big breakthrough with is, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm the founder of Loci and we offer simulation as a service for large scale enterprises and institutions that have complex populations that are hard to reach. Um, and uh, close full loops of risk uh, that are human factors in their property and casualty uh, premiums, but also just automate workflows. Um, we have to first model people correctly before we start talking about how people are going to interpret information. And unfortunately, we've done a really bad job of that. Um, if you look uh, at just a basic, um, sorry, if it's okay if I just take over the screen for a second. Like if it, it, this is a, the, the most up-to-date human dynamics model, it's from the 1960s. It's called Fruin. Um, it's based off of, off of a crowd of 90%, 95% six foot tall males carrying briefcases. And it's used to test the egress, ingress, and just general levels of service in all building code. This is crazy, right? Like this is absolutely insane. Um, it, 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 this doesn't tell us anything. There's no bags. There's no. There's no babies. There's no phones. Right? Like, there's. This is. This is not reflective of human behavior. And so it's like we're trying to get into all this AI and all these things like that. And it's like we have to actually break apart the different realms. Um, like our, our the way our physical body moves can be extended through wheelchairs, like sensor canes, uh, augmented reality glasses, things like that. Um, how we conceptualize space and make decisions is its own set. It's its own system. And if we don't separate that, humans just stay a complexity problem, right? Our cognition stays a complexity problem because like, how are you actually gonna decide what the right amount of information is for a firefighter if you're not first thinking about how their brain cells are firing in these different situations? If you're not first thinking about how familiar they are and things like that and modeling that, like it's just an impossible task that we'll never get right if we don't start with our actual, with, without actually the things that we we know we've done enough neuroscience to be able to like we have enough pictures of, of people's brains to know which parts are activating when we see certain things or do certain things if we don't map that as separate to how our body reacts in an environment based off of what's in it on it and around it then we're never going to get it right um so just i highly recommend looking at that if you guys ever want to work on anything like this with me we have a, a a group a global group working with the university college of london to commercialize um a 400 person data set that gives you a that they used to, as a an early detection tool for alzheimer's um which in order to get that early detection tool for alzheimer's they had to get a baseline healthy navigation ability across all demographics and age groups and that's what they've accomplished but now we need to actually put that into, into agents that don't walk around like they're carrying briefcases and that actually reflect human movement and i'll stop there bert, bert and bart want to give any kind of two cents and then we'll just kind of keep going around the horn i'll give it to you bert i i i, I would like to inv invite that woman to go ride on a fire truck sometime so, so she can take all the stuff that's in her brain and at least- I am a firefighter, don't worry. I oh, just wonder, oh, wonderful. <laughs> you, you, need, you need to write an article about what's in your brain and what you just said and how it applies to the fire service. We need your help. Take what's in your brain and write it for Firehouse Magazine or Fire Engineering. Just tell us what you do. And 
if you're a firefighter, you know how you can make that transition. It's it's it, that's I'd love to meet you sometime. Hopefully, you go to some conference somewhere. I mean, that was absolutely brilliant. And the fact that you're a firefighter, God bless you. We need more of you. And and use use your use your knowledge to help us. Nope. And the, the problem is nobody's going to pay you. <laughs> so thank you. Bart. Uh, yeah. Uh, bringing the human the human back in the loop. Uh, I love it. But let's go on. There's a, lot, a great, great amount of people who still want to say something with yeah. 30 minutes. <laughs> let's go. Yeah. And we might go a little bit over. And so feel free. Anyone who wants to leave at the top of the hour, we've got 12 minutes, 12 minutes at the top of the hour. We'll probably go a little bit longer, but we'll go, we got, we got Matt, Josh, Jerry, Brandon, um, kind of give us a little bit who you are, rapid fire thoughts and questions, and we'll just kind of, you know, keep it going here. So Matt, thanks for being here. Sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, Matt, hi, Aldrich. I work for American Association of Insurance Services. It's called AIS. Um, but uh, um, previously NFPA, Atlanta Fire, a few other places. Uh, um, but my question was sort of around uh, um, the, the discussion around like basically solutions and looking for problems. That's a common uh, <clears throat> a common theme, and frankly, uh, for me, a common frustration, particularly sometimes when I'm at like the uh, some of the uh, DHS S and T or NIST projects where they're having all these uh, um, all this funded research where they're they're like, hey, I had this um, I had this cool tool, and they're like, hey, uh, you know, this is a new domain I can use it in. And they're basically just trying to sell their wares, and it's like great, but <clears throat> like it's not really a many of the times really not the problems that are uh, facing firefighters. That said, though, uh, um, there are whether it's really truly we need the AI solution or uh, or things that may masquerade as an AI solution that do accomplish the same thing. Uh, a number of years ago, kind of Bart alluded to it. Uh, um, he and I worked on a, a project where we were trying to actually see could we turn a uh, like an incident report on his head, and could we actually have take a narrative and then pull out the the codes from that because. There's a whole lot of conversation about if, if there are ways to, uh, um, uh, to to basically take the data that firefighters enter and, and come up with some great um, you know insights out of it. But the problem is, is you've already lost all the good like rich information that goes into it. So a firefighter, they they you know they experience this, and in fact, actually one of the battalion chiefs that I worked with in Atlanta on a, uh, recently in a, a podcast talked about this, um, and it's funny because he was always seen as a very "Quote unquote salty um, operational focused fire battalion chief," but he in, uh, recently uh, talked about how uh, he would ask, he would do like what they call hot washes, and uh, you know they would give these very elaborate, uh, uh, detailed um, play by play of what they did. And then he he'd look at their end first report and says, "Hmm," because all it says in your unit report is arrived on scene, like uh, established water supply, did mop up. And he's like, uh, you should spend an hour telling me all this really detailed information about what your you and your your company did, and then uh, um, and then like basically all we have to to show for it is really uh, meaningless and, and useless information. So by by turning this on its head, um, this is one of the things that Bart and I were working on. Is uh, and this is again pre this is not AI. It was, it was just using some um, some kind of semantic web uh, kind of technology of like. You basically just type in a narrative of any narrative, and it would pull out the Enfers codes. So as there, obviously, most folks know here in the U.S., Enfers is going through a massive um, reimagination. And there's part of that conversation is saying, well, we just need to get rid of codes. We need to get rid of um, all the data elements. Just really boil it down to the smallest number of data elements that are possible. I actually challenge that. I 100% agree. We need to not ask firefighters to enter those codes. The uh, as we start thinking about what the future of data will look like, uh, we do need standardized data. We need standardized data, but we just don't need firefighters having to try to remember of like which of the ten thousand codes to select through on a drop-down menu. Uh, use technology for that part, and I really think that is where we're going to see uh, tremendous uh, strides. Is by once we take the firefighters and take uh, and um, and the kind of the, the clunky. Uh, process that, of course, they all know and love of at two o'clock in the morning, spending a half hour trying to write the darn instant report um, and then fighting with the computer because it, you know, it crashed out or whatever in the middle of it. But the more we can take firefighters out of that, have them tell the story of what they did, whether it's spoken or written, um, 
and pull whatever we need in the codes and be able to do NLP and all the other stuff we can do, the cool stuff we can do on top of that. That is a current problem. That is a, there are solutions that are out there and that is something that can really dramatically benefit the entire fire service right now. Bert and Bart, our featured guests, rapid hot take, any response, context you want to add to that before we go over to Josh? And thanks, Matt, for the comments. Yeah, I've been in the project, so I'll let Bert <laughs> comment on this. The only thing I would add into that area is that the insurance industry has lots of data on the fires that they pay off on. If we could just access that data to really understand the fire problem, we'd be better off or even fire loss. But most of the time, that's proprietary information that we can't access. So that that's part of it. It's not that it's not available. It's that sometimes we don't know it or sometimes we can't access it. So again, it goes back to using what we already have uh, to the best. And that, that's the first step. We don't have to reinvent anything. We just have to use what's available. Bar, anything else you want to add there before we go to Josh? I think Jerry and Brandon. Uh, no, I think Matt's comment in the chat says it all. Perfect. All right, Josh, over to you. Tell us who you are, a little bit of uh, context, and love to hear what you got. Yeah, Josh Wilkins, uh, just recently retired with San Bernardino County Fire Department as a captain. And I'm kind of on my next chapter right now, but uh, it's, I'm really pursuing my uh, burning desire to solve uh, a lot of these problems by combining technology and our tradition um, and just the way we've always worked. Uh, I'm tired of, you know, burying guys for really stupid reasons uh, that could have been prevented with proper information that, that already exists. And so that's, that's my main motivation right now. Uh, but, you know, to everybody's point, and I think everybody's kind of alluded to the same thing is, Obviously, AI is not going to, you know, be the one thing that's going to solve us, make us, you know, have the best decisions or tell us which corner of the building to attack or whatever. But really, it's it's still it comes down to it's got to be fireman proof or in this case, chief proof to be used on the fire ground and to be able to take all this amazing data that we're surrounded by everywhere in so many different ways and so many different industries. Access, access the existing data that's already there, the assets that already been invested in, and actually bring it all together and bring it to where it's now usable by, you know, a firefighter that's, you know, his adrenaline's going through the roof. He just woke up at two in the morning. He's got gloves on and he's got, a, you know, how can you make it ingestible with the best possible data in the world take all that and make it ingestible by a firefighter in that, you know, that situation to give him options of is he now knows there's a basement. Now that's going to make his, his decision process completely different. Had he not known and along with the outcome completely different. Uh, you know, for me right now, I'm trying to how to integrate this into the wildland fire space. And because 90% of the fatalities now are, lack of information. Had they known the fire was at the base of the mountain when they made that turn, or had they known that the wind was about to change on them, or that they were getting cut off and they had you know no visible sight of the fire, that, that information is available. It's just not readily available in their hands. We're still handing out paper maps in so many ways. Mm -hmm. So my biggest thing now is Take all the existing assets. And here's the biggest fight to, you know, say the city, city manager or the council member is we're basically taking all that you've already invested in, millions of dollars in public works and the GIS department and all that kind of stuff. Amazing data that we could use every single day, whether you're on the tail, you know, in the, the fire engine, uh, doing the inspections on the, you know, the wildland space. We're just not using it. And we have, and most of the time, we don't even know it exists. So that's where I see the biggest thing is having AI crunch all that information, turning it into a usable piece of information. So now we still use our brains to make that decision, but now we're informed. We have all the best data 
And then, you know, you add the, the, the Google glasses and now you can see that best data in relationship to you, which to me, you know, that excites me. Um, so I, that's, that's where I see it going. And I'd like to hear, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of pushback with the AI. And I think that's one of the best ways to, to counter it is we're just, you know, we're taking all your investments and combining it into a useful piece. That's it. That's all I got. Burton Park, back actually, any thoughts, comments? And, and even Jerry, if you wanted to build on that too, but Burke, go yeah, for it. The, and I think the way to do that, because I don't want, I don't think city managers think of the fire service as their high tech division. Uh, a lot of times, you know, strong, strong guys, strong gals, they go fast. Uh, they, they chop things, to, but they don't see us as their, their intellectual. I don't want to say that sounds bad. So, so we need to find people that are doing that successfully. Exactly. What, the example that you were giving, and they need to present at the city manager association conference. Yes. I'll bet you there aren't any fire chiefs that present at the city managers association, but I'll bet you there's fire chiefs. I'll bet you there's GIS people. I'll bet you there's public works, but there's probably no fire chiefs presenting at the city manager association conference. So, and that's our, that's our own fault. Uh, some people are doing great stuff. Why wasn't there more about this this firefighter, you know, Patrick Jackson at fire conferences because he was actually demonstrating Google Glass being used for driving to the fire scene and finding fire hydrants. Mm -hmm. But I never saw that again. Never heard a thing from him after that. He went to go make, I don't know, I'm assuming he went to make go make big bucks at Google Glass because other industries wanted what he brought. We didn't even capitalize on what we had available to us. Nobody's keeping us from doing that. It's just leadership deciding this is important. Bart, anything you want to add on that? And then we'll throw it to Jerry. Um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna quickly go back to what Josh says about the uh, having having access to all the data to make meta informed decisions. And I I like this I like the statement where you where you would say, well, if you go to any incident commander and ask like, what information do you want? And 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 probably the answer is I want all the information, and and I still have this this sort of um, vision of um, Jack Nicholson, a few good men, this last end scene where where we could just sort of film that and re remake that. It's like I want all the data, and then somebody's standing up and scream out loud, "You can't handle all the data," uh, because that is one of the biggest problems I see with the amount of. Uh, data that's being thrown at us. And maybe AI could filter it out, but I still see just taking all this information and trying to throw it at people is not going to improve the uh, improve the situation. It's probably going to make make it far worse. That's my two cents to it. Thanks, Bart. Jerry, tell us your name, where you're from, um, yep. where you're with, and give us your thoughts. Hello, everybody. I'm Jerry Strike. I'm in the Minneapolis, Minnesota area. I spent 32 years in the fire service as a fire firefighter, half those years as a fire chief in the metro area and emergency manager, now doing consulting. And I have done uh, quite a bit of business development in the technology area. Uh, and I also do a lot of consulting as an organizational development practitioner for localities. And I'll tell you, to Bert's uh, point, I can, I can uh, tell you with with uh, with a lot of truth that fire uh, officials do not speak to their city managers and local government uh, and clearly define what they do. Chiefs commonly ask me, hey, my city council doesn't even know what service they want to provide. No, that's true because they don't even know what they what, what you do. But uh, there's so much discussion going on through Josh and so on. The two things I wanted to talk about was one is our systems are so siloed. We have so many systems out there and so many entrepreneurs creating new systems that everybody's purchasing all these systems. And now we're in a position where we have to try to get it to integrate with other systems. And I'm almost a proponent of a national EMS system that can then be attached to something that's vetted and so on, so that we're all using the same kind of technology in many ways 
so it can be vetted, uh, which is one of my first my first uh, issues with AI is is the cautions. We have we have our baby boomers and Gen Xs who are not native technology who are trying to still learn this stuff. I uh, at one time on the fire floor I had a 72 year old and a 19 year old. 72 year old wanted me to write a letter and pin it on a cork board. 19 year old wanted me to put it on a video so they could watch it when they're running on a treadmill. So our our workforce isn't fully antiquated into the technology. So my caution is for our newer generations when they're looking at chat G GBT and they believe that, inf that information is actually real because they typed it in and that's the information they got. And it may not be real. Who's vetting that on the side of the fire service and EMS? And then finally to, to end, um, I'm really interested in AI for predictive measures. I believe we need to focus more on predictive measures to help determine all the data we have, line of duty loss, uh, building information, all that stuff, put it together so that we can predict when we may get in a crash. We don't even connect a lot of systems to the, the data that's within a vehicle it, that has its own computer. Most people don't even touch that data, but what speed am I going at? Well, you know, try to predict that. Where, when, when would you get lost? Uh, when will the building collapse using building sensor data? On and on and on. But uh, I appreciate the discussion. I remember years ago, we were at low pressure bottles in a steel tank with an elephant hose. I had to stick in my jacket and we talked about going to high pressure systems and people went ballistic, you know. Um, but the fact that you talk early about these kinds of things, eventually solutions and benefits come out of it. So thanks for your time. Thanks, Jerry. Bert or Bart, did you want to give any context or shed any light on that? Well, I, I've always been very cautious with, with the whole predictive stuff. Um, specifically because we're doing outliers, where we're dealing with outliers in the fire service. So I think for for the granular things, it should be it should be possible to say, oh, these kind of incidents will will occur in a certain location, uh, etc. But that's very fine or not very fine grained. Um, that's probably where you can go. But if you still see the, the the quality issues of data, even though the data that comes from from the assessor's office, which is being used and, and discussed quite a bit in uh, in the chat as well. That's also not completely perfect. So to do very accurate predictions on based on that is is problematic at best. So we're just about five minutes past the hour, and I mean I think some of these sometimes these conversations should be seventy five minutes or at least maybe be a two part or twelve part series monthly, um, and we're we're already getting planning more roundtables on a monthly basis. But we still got some people here, and frankly, we're not necessarily saying hey leave yet. But I want to give anyone last kind of a final chance to make a 30 second comment or something really quick. And then Bart and Bert will kind of finish off with their final mic drops, but anyone want to say anything else? I mean, I see some great names in here. I don't need necessarily the volunteer told anyone, but if you want to say or drop anything, now is the time, you know, nothing wrong with the self, uh, self promotion too. If you get a pro or if you got a project you're working on, or if you get an initiative you want to bring up, um, Anything anyone else wants to bring up or talk about right now? Hold the crickets for a couple more seconds. All right, well, uh, Ken. So Kevin, um, the NIST FirstNet 5x5 five five is coming up in San Diego at the end of this month. Is there, um, are there people on the call going to San Diego and interested in possibly continuing this amazing discussion in a bar? because there's a lot of valuable comments that were being made. Thanks. Well said, I'm putting that in the chat. I know um, there, I see a couple of people in this chat. I believe Sonny from, uh, Sonny Kirkley from IU. Um, Alex, I believe your team from Ascent is going out. Um, and I just put, I just put that in the chat there, but um, Steve Dirksen, you're going. So yeah, everyone make sure to connect with everyone here on, on LinkedIn, because that is a, a really important show with some good activity going on. So Ken, thanks for bringing that up. Thank you. Any Anyone else kind of, uh, if you got a project initiative, something we should be aware of, 
Um, again, there's no wrong comments or answers here. Uh, Ian Greatbach, give us give us what you got. Great back, excuse me. Hello, everyone. Um, apologies for, for being late. Uh, I got the, the time difference slightly wrong, but uh, my colleague Chris Hans was here. So we're both from West Midlands Fire Service, which is the second biggest metropolitan fire service in, in England. Uh, and we're basically the, the sum pretty much of the innovation team. Um, just wanted to raise, and I, I kind of know Matt and a kind of couple of other names on, on the call. We have got a couple of AI projects running in our control at the moment. Um, and we, we basically, the, the, the way it's worked is we've got UCL, uh, Sam mentioned them earlier, University College London, two of their master students in information handling. And we've kind of basically given them access to pretty much all of our control data. So anytime somebody makes a nine, you know, an emergency call uh, comes in, it's transcribed and they are, we don't quite, I mean, I've been away for a couple of weeks, so I don't exactly know how far they've got, but they've been, the, some of the projections of what they could do with that in terms of speeding up the response based on the natural language processing uh, of the stuff that's coming in is quite amazing. So um, they have to finish because they have to hand in their master's degree by the end of the summer. Um, and if it's okay with you guys, I'll, I'll either get them to present to you or, or pass on their, their projects to this group. Absolutely. Make sure to send that information to me and we'll pass it along. And I think okay, that's yeah. that's exactly what this kind of forums are for. We'd love to even do another round table or podcast in, in that kind of conversation. So and I, I'm putting the form into the chat again. If you if I don't have your email, please just fill out that form. Just asking for email. I'm not going to spam you or anything. Just sending you relevant information. Uh, but Ian, make sure that uh, if you can fill out that form, too. So I got your email um, and then we can make sure that we're connected so we can get that information out. I'll do that now. And just, just to add to what I was saying, that's what we've got currently working. We are, we are looking to integrate AI into all sorts of things, looking like city CCTV cameras to see if they can spot smoke earlier than the, the emergency calls, looking at fleet management, PPE management, all sorts of stuff. We're, re we're really kind of quite keen on it. Anyway, I'll, I'll let somebody else speak now. No, that's good. We're kind of rapid fire here just in the final moments. And again, if you got to go, go, um, but we appreciate anyone else that's sticking around. Anyone else got a final, got a project or an initiative or kind of a final comment they want to make uh, before we part ways here? Uh, I got to head out, but I just want to say, um, Bart and Bert, thank you so much for all you do. Um, Bart, you've really changed how I view data in the fire service from that first chat. Um, and then also got me to read all of Celeb's work. So thank you for that. Um, Bert, your book is sitting right there on our dining room table here at the office, and it is required reading for all new people. So there it is. Yeah, there's the book. Yeah, wow. Super. Thank you both for all that you do. And thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kip. Thanks, Alex. Anyone else any final kind of comments they want to make? All right. Well, I'll turn it over to, to Bart and Bert. If you want to just give us a final mic drop of a 30 second, any based on the conversations you have, um, any sort of comments or thoughts that you want to leave us with here today. Uh, the, the only thing I would say is, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because uh, Bart gave me an attaboy for it. You know, we, we're still having a hard time getting firefighters to put their seatbelts on. So uh, AI is wonderful, but all of us can make a difference today if we just make sure everybody on a fire truck puts their seatbelt on. Now, I don't know how, I, how AI can do that, but I do know that firefighters have disconnected seatbelt alarms. So nobody hears the alarm and then nobody goes to fix it. So is that an AI problem? Is that a human problem? Uh, and any technology can be used for good or evil. AI was just added to the, the threats to humanity along with nuclear war and pandemics. So that's the other end of the spectrum, right? We're, we're still over here at the baby stage, just trying to figure it out. Uh, don't be afraid of it. Use it if, you, if you're interested in it. Uh, get on, go on chat GPT and try it out. Uh, you may be able to get past the, the, uh, the, the, the bot check in half the time that I did, but it's, it's all still good and we need, to be, we need to be part of it. We can't be afraid of it. So I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, I'm done.
Thanks, Bert. And Bart. Bart, for some reason, I can't hear you right now. Sorry, I was coughing, so I muted, yep. muted myself uh, mechanically here. Um, thanks for putting this up. It's great to have this conversation, and probably you could have spent spend another two hours on it. Um, I, th I think uh, I might sound very critical towards AI, um, but I think we should be critical thinkers. I think we should not be afraid of it. I wholeheartedly agree with that, uh, with, with Bert about that. Um, but I think critical thinking is the important part that we need to foster within our communities to, to, towards using this technology. Um, that is what I try to bring in and, and bring the human in where it's, it's a, it's a business where we help humans by humans. So please bring humans into this, into this game of bringing AI into the fire service. That's the last thing I wanted to say. Thank you. Well said, Bart. Well, on behalf of everyone from smart firefighting from Darley and the entire smart firefighting community, Bart and Bert, Thank you for what you're doing. Keep continue to be trailblazers and, and pioneers of, of bringing this information and technology to everyone. These roundtables are about bringing us together and, and, and sharing ideas and sharing best practices. So if you got an idea for the next roundtable, give me a shout. If you want to talk about podcasts, let me know um, and just continue to push it forward. Um, it definitely, it's that kind of cliche phrase that it takes a village. So Appreciate all of you for being here. We'll continue to have one of these a month along with different um, podcasts on a weekly basis and um, make sure, you know, last I'll put it, I'll put it in the chat, but make sure to check out the smartfirefighting.com podcast, which you can find here in the link. And for that, we are done. So thank you all. Have the best Wednesday. Much appreciated. And I look forward to staying in touch with all of you. Thank you Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Kevin. Great to meet you all, old and new friends.